All right, so we're all set. All right, so we're at uh, chapter 6 of Romans, verse 18. And uh, it's, it starts as, Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I, 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. And as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness, and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. All right, so what, what do we think he, he means by uh, yielding your members? He was saying you, you once yielded your members unto uh, unrighteousness and iniquity, but now, now render your, your instruments or your, um, what's the term that he uses, your... Um, your body instruments there we go your instruments so what do you what what do we think he's talking about your senses your tongue your, your senses your yeah. tongue your hands yeah. your eyes your ears you know many people talk about well you know we should only listen to gospel music we shouldn't listen to uh, worldly music um are are we correct in saying that we should not listen to any worldly music at all, or we should only listen to gospel music? No, no. Um, but you don't want to listen to music or watch things that are um, uh, sinful or ungodly, like watching pornography. You doesn't this, mean you can't watch any TV, but you don't sit and watch pornography because we know that that's sinful. I I, I remember when I was younger, uh, my. Uh, my father had a girlfriend, Sue, who uh, she went to a sanctified Christian church, uh, and they believed that women women had to wear dresses and uh, that they could not go to movies. And uh, they they said that uh, my father was unholy because he had HBO, uh, so he, he, he wasn't he was unrighteous. Um, uh, you know you. There's a verse in Corinthians that talks about, uh, you know, that th some things are uh, are temptation for some people, but some things are not temptation for others. Um, so, I mean, you have to you have to judge yourself. You have to look and see if are certain things drawing you away from God. Right. You know, I always always use the example: How comfortable would I be doing this right in front of God? You know, uh, you know, we uh, when we were younger, we uh, watched what we did in front of our parents because we were going to be punished or corrected or whatever. I mean, isn't God our ultimate parent and our ultimate judge? Uh, and who he who knows everything's and sees all. So uh, we should we should watch what we do and, and what we use our instruments for what we use our senses for. Uh, you always said you have to protect your eye gate, and that's especially uh, with pornography uh, and things that are meant to tantalize your your eye gate or your ear gate with music and uh, mm -hmm. different types of movies and things like that that are going to draw you closer to uh, fleshly fleshly behavior, following mm -hmm. after the flesh instead of after the spirit of God. Uh, we. Uh, as w what is it that's going to help us to control our instruments or control uh, what we do with the tools that God has given us, our vision and our, our hearing? What, what is it that's going to help us to follow after a path of righteousness and stay away, stay away from following the world? Studying the Bible. Studying the Bible is definitely one. Taking in God's word and becoming more... Christ-like, and, and you know, it says it tells us to take on the image of Christ, becoming more Christ-like. The only way you're going to do that is if you read His Word and you know what it says. Right. And uh, what's what what's the important part about right division that pertains to to that? What why why is it important to rightly divide the Scriptures when you're looking at receiving guidance for your for your walk your christian walk to understand Why? to understand that not everything is for us to understand what program we're under okay 
Now that goes into the question that I asked, what helps you? Um, what, what is the guide for walking a Christian life today? Whereas it was different for the nation of Israel. What did, what did the nation of Israel use to, uh, to, to help in their, in their, in their walk? They <laughs> use their they Christian the walk. Law. <laughs> they well, use the law. We, the law, the law, the law was their guide. The law was letting right. them know what was righteous. So that's why God gave Moses the law. So they would know what righteousness is <clears throat> and they would see that they were not righteous. It was meant as a mirror also to show them the truth of what they were and the fact that they needed a savior. Because if you don't, if you don't have the law, do you know what you're doing is wrong? Right, you don't. <laughs> so, uh, what did What did God say about it when there was no law? There was a. Uh, it was in this this chapter earlier when we were reading. What did He say about when there was no law? There's no transgression. There's no transgression when there's no law. So, in other words, the the sins were not held against them because there was no law. There was no guidance. Now, knowing that they were led by the law. What are, what are we what are we led by? Grace. Uh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is the major one of the major differences between Israel's program and us as uh, modern day Christians. That we have the indwelling Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us and to point us and show us what is righteous and what is not. Uh, so he and he does that by a, a conscious. Think about think about when you you know we all battle with certain sins. We we have you know a difficult time with them. When you're about when you're about to commit that sin, do you do you know what you're about to do? Do you do you feel it coming on? Do you feel having to make a choice? Sure do. <laughs> yeah, we do. And and sometimes we choose right. That's when the, the uh, spirit is able to uh, convict you, and you, you, you take that little bit of time that it, it takes to turn away from that sin. But when we don't turn away, when we, when we kind of shut off the Holy Spirit and block the Holy Spirit, and quench the Holy Spirit, and we keep walking in that fleshly direction, but we know what we're doing. We know exactly what we're doing, and we're making a choice. Mm -hmm. We're making a choice, and, and thank God that, that we have a Savior who died for all our sins. Because if it wasn't for his, his death on the cross, none of us could do this. For real. All right, verse 21. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from, this, from sin... And becoming servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end of ever, everlasting life. So we, we, the Holy Spirit is trying to produce fruit in us. He's trying to, uh, to have us walk in a, a righteous walk, uh, uh, creating fruits of the Spirit. Uh I think we don't have too much more. Let me finish uh, reading the rest of this, and then we can then we can pick up on the questions where we were. So twenty two. But now, being made free from from sin and becoming servants to God, ye have your your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mm -hmm. Earlier. Uh, this is okay. So that's the last, the last uh, verse. Right. Um, turn, turn to your. Let's let's pick up at the questions. Let's see some good you have. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over the questions that we asked last week, and let's quickly uh, answer those. Uh, we we have a uh, we have a, a new person here today, Joe. Uh, everybody, greet him. Uh, he's uh, uh, somebody Michael uh, gave the. Uh, thing to to join the bible study okay. uh i don't know if did my did michael get you a book yet joe oh no not not yet okay 
Yeah, so you don't have these questions. So we'll, we'll, I'm going to go over the questions. There's 12 questions. We're going to we're going to go over them one by one and discuss the answers. We answered some of them last week, so we're just going to get uh, quick answers. If you have any questions, please stop us. Ask. We love questions. Okay. All right. Um, first one: list all of the different kinds of death mentioned in or alluded to in the Bible. And how, how many how many different deaths were there? Four. Uh, that, no, I think there was I think there was five. It was five? Okay. Was I got five, four. yes. Okay, so first we have physical death. Physical right. death, that one's kind of self explanatory. Uh, right. physical death. We all we all uh, have we all die. We're all going to die except those who will be taken up in the rapture. Uh, and there, the Bible alludes to many times to physical death. Um, well, I put them in the order. Uh, Cain and Abel, Abel uh, experienced physical death, murder. He was murdered by his brother. Okay. Second, we have spiritual death. <laughs> now, who can give me a, a who can give me a, two, two? Let's get, give two examples of spiritual death. Okay, what was the what who 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 excuse me who experienced spiritual death first in the Bible? Adam, Jesus Christ, Adam and Eve. Oh, was Adam, Adam and Eve? Like Adam and Eve when sin came to Adam and Eve. Adam, Adam and Eve. Eve. So, how, so what? How do we define spiritual death? Separate or take on our sins. Separation. Separation from God. From God, the Holy Spirit. Se separation from God. Uh, why is it important to understand it? Uh, sin isn't always in in that equation for spiritual death. Why is that important to understand? I'm not sure of the question. Well, we, we I, I said give two examples of spiritual death. One was Adam and Eve. Yes. Uh, when when they sin, they experience spiritual death. So how how, right. how are we going to? Because Adam lived in 930 years, he experienced physical death 930 years after he was created. Right. So, but he experienced spiritual death immediately upon them eating the fruit. Right. Okay. When they, when they disobeyed God, so they, they sinned. That was the first sin. They experienced spiritual death. And so what exactly is it that they experienced? That, that's what I'm They lost their righteousness. Yeah. Separation, yeah. separation from God. Mm -hmm. they, they, were, they were now out of fellowship with God. Uh, and they, what and they real they realized that they were naked because they had the not they had the knowledge now of good and evil to where they only understood good at first. Now they understood good and evil. Now what is what is the second spiritual death? In scripture. Jesus, isn't it Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ's Christ death on the cross. Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, did Jesus Christ commit any personal sins? No. No. He, he had to he had to um be parted from sin. I mean from God. From God in order to take on all the sins of mankind. Exactly. He had the sins of the world imputed to him, just as his righteousness is imputed to us. We we are incapable of performing perfect righteousness. Only Christ could do that. And his, his righteousness, when we believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, uh, he, it is now then imputed to us. Uh, or a better way of thinking of it is, is it's assigned to us. We, we, we get the benefit of it. Where Jesus Christ had the sins of the world imputed to him in order so that he could pay for them. So he had to take on sin. And in doing that, he was separated from God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, remember when he was on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why have you separated me from me? And that's Psalms 22. Take your time and read that. That was a, a beautiful letter uh, from David, poem from David, uh, talking about the, the future death on the cross. And he answers, he answers the question uh, that Jesus Christ asked, why have you separated me? Why have you forsaken me? The answer is because I have become sin. 
and you are holy. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit remained holy. And the only, and they, so they could not come in contact uh, with sin. So they had to separate themselves from Jesus Christ, the man, from his humanity, So in order for him to pay for our sin. Okay? So you have physical death, you have spiritual death. What was the third death? Sexual death. Sexual death. And what is that example? Other than, you know, 60-year-old men. <laughs> I shouldn't say that I'm getting close to 60, right? <laughs> so, yes. You can't tell me on question number one? Yes. No, no, you know, I was just going I was going over the questions quickly so that Joe could catch up. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm having a lot of technical difficulties, but I'm my I'm on my phone and it's working now. The volume's working. Okay. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. So we're just we're just going over the desk. We went over fear, uh, physical, spiritual, and now we need an example for a sexual death. You can't Abraham. Put, hey. Abraham. Yes, Abraham. Oh. Remember, he he was sexually he was he had he was sexually dead, uh, and that's why what he believed what God had told him that a that the seed of a, uh, the nation was going to come through him, and. Mm -hmm. Sarah also was sexually dead, and, mm -hmm. and, right. and was bar she was barren. She was barren. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and what was what was Sarah's reaction when 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 Jesus Christ told her that she was going to bear a child in the within the next year? Wow. She she, she laughed. She laughed. Yeah, she didn't believe yeah, she it. She laughed. <laughs> so, I don't know how much uh, how much trust she had, but thankfully uh, Abraham had enough belief for both of them. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, what is the okay. what is the fourth death? Physical death. Nope. We got physical, oh, yeah. spiritual, yeah. sexual. Huh? Yeah. Death that's it. Death to sin. Dead to sin. Mm -hmm. All right. So, what's a good example of dead to sin? Um, what? Hey. Yeah. Was that Brian? I don't know. I don't know if it's, it's considered the flesh. Uh, the, the Does it start with an I? Start with an I. Yeah. yeah. Um, sin, you not believe? Sure, not sure what you mean there. I thought if, we were dead to sin when we were in Christ. Yeah. We are dead to sin in Christ. Uh, and mm -hmm. our... Our sins are are buried with Christ, and we are buried with Christ. Uh, verse eleven. Verse eleven, Journey. Verse eleven. Okay. Yeah, verse eleven. Likewise, reckon ye some yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. So there it is. So right, to be indeed unto sin. Verse eleven. Uh, to Jesus Christ. Yeah. So dead. Right. So dead. So dead to sin. So physical death, spiritual death. Uh, sexual death, dead, dead to sin, and what is the last one? The second death. The second death. <laughs> the second death, and that takes place at the uh, at the white throne judgment. Mm -hmm. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and they are they are presented without perfect righteousness. Right. Are are there, are are there are there sins brought up when they're judged? No. No, you know no. when I when I was younger, my my older brother when he when he uh, when he witnessed to us, he 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 gave us this track called um, "This Is Your Life." And it went through and it showed somebody getting saved. Yeah, the chick track. Yep, and it showed it showed somebody getting saved, and then it showed somebody not getting saved and going to the white throne judgment, and they they had a big. They had, you know, it had the, the masses that were going in front of God for judgment, and then it had a big screen. It looked like a, you know, like a 144-inch screen TV. <laughs> and it was broadcasting every sin that the person had across that screen. And as a, as a, a preteen, my thought when I saw that was, I hope they have chairs because they're going to be there a while, especially <laughs> when they get to me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're, we're going to be there a while. I hope they're serving popcorn. <laughs> but, uh, 
In, in actuality, uh, Christ, Christ covered sin on the cross, mm -hmm. not only for the believer, but this is the grace of God. He covered it for the unbeliever also. He paid for their sins. So if it, remember, remember what so John the Baptist said to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, this is part of the sin. It's not limited to atonement. It's be, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So all of the sin of the whole world is taken away. And when it says um, in Romans, I forget the verse, um, talks about the first man, Adam, who brought this sin, came into the world. We just read it. It might have been in verse chapter 6 here or, or chapter 5. And then through Christ, who is the last Adam, sin exits the world. So the whole issue of sin, the whole problem of sin, is dealt with through Christ. Sin is so, not the issue. We're not, nobody's separated from God anymore because of sin. They are separated, but not okay. Don't 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 answer that. I was going to ask that question. So yeah. if if sin is not keeping anyone from going to heaven, what is keeping those from going to heaven? Not believing in Christ. Not believing. Not well, believing, have, but when well, when we believe, <clears throat> what is it that we're given? And there's a uh, there's a verse I believe it's in. Correct me, Michael. Either in Psalms or or Proverbs, and it says, "Who can stand in the presence of an all-consuming fire, an all all holy God?" Yeah, we got to memorize that verse. I think it's I think it. Uh, let me look it up, Junior. I think it might be. Uh, Either Isaiah or uh, Ezekiel. I think it might be Ezekiel. Okay, Ezekiel I'm way off. That's one of those verses. Ezekiel 33 or Isaiah 33. Well, that yeah, that verse that's, that's, gives that verse gives the answer to that question. So, what is it that we what is it that we attain when we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Righteousness. righteousness. Not just righteousness. Perfect, perfect. righteousness. Perfect, perfect. 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 righteousness. Perfect. That's that's the price of admission. That's what you need to stand in the presence of an all-consuming God who's an all-consuming fire. He cannot, nothing unrighteous can be in his presence. So when we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that is what is imputed to us as sin was imputed to Christ. Christ's righteousness is imputed. It is deposited in our account. So then we are perfectly righteous, and we can be with God for all eternity. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, okay, so those are the four deaths. Now, which... It's Isaiah 33. Isaiah 33. Let me, yeah, let me, let me read that real quick. Such an, yep. This is an astonishing verse. It says, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell? Great question. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? What a description of God. The devouring fire. Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? And then he answers that question. He that walketh righteously. You have to have absolute, absolute righteousness to do that. And speaketh uprightly. He that despises or hates the gain of the oppression, and he goes on with this long list describing a, a saved person. But he mentions the fact that, that no one can stand in God's presence without absolute righteousness, which is what is imputed to us the moment we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Okay. Now, which baptism... Now, first off, how many baptisms are there in the Bible? The 15, 12, uh, God. I, I, I count about 14. Okay, so about 14. So the Lord says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, so there's only one baptism that is um, uh, acceptable. acceptable now. Which baptism is it? Baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is, this is the baptism where he... Uh, associates us, identifies us with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, how appropriate, because the water, water mm -hmm. baptism 
associated the Jew with the Messiah who was present on earth. So that, what, that's the association that was being made. That's the identification that was being made. And as I said, most appropriate that we are identified with his death, death burial, and resurrection. Yeah, Joe All mentioned, right. Joe just texted us and mentioned, and rightly so, this is a dry baptism. So we have wet baptisms, we have dry baptisms, we even have a fire baptism, which we don't want any part of, of course. Amen. Amen. All right, and we had listed two, two verses that showed uh, the second death. One is Revelation chapter 20, I think verse uh, 13 or somewhere in the thereabouts talks about the second death. And uh, I don't remember, like I said, I lost my sheet with my answers on it. Uh, yeah. Let me say two words about uh, question three there, Jenny. We, we listed two verses talking about the second death. Um, but we want to mention the fact also that death literally means death. Uh, from the beginning, when God said, For dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return, he explains what he's talking about when he uses the word death. If man had eternal life from the very beginning, God would never say to man, You're going to die. In other words, the word die doesn't mean what he says it means. So that's a long that's a long discussion. But the second death means that you have no possibility of ever living again. When you die, there is no be, there is no resurrection after the second there, death. There's no resurrection. That's what the second death is all about. When you die, yes, annihilation, Joe. Exactly. That he uses the word perish. The Bible uses the word perish. John three sixteen, which everybody knows, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. He never says, shall not be tormented forever and ever in the lake of fire or anything close to that. He says, shall not perish. If you perish, which is used also of Sodom and Gomorrah, when he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's the illustration in uh, Second Peter and also Jude, verse 7, where he talks about this is the example, or this is the illustration, this is the explanation of what he means when he talks about uh, eternal fire and judgment. It's compared, and the illustration or the example that's given to us is that of Sodom and, Sodom and Gomorrah. So we well, let's, let, let's discuss that for a minute. So what do we, yeah. what do we think that God means when he says e eternal, e eternal destruction, like in Sodom and, and Gomorrah? It, can, can you go to Sodom and Gomorrah today? No. Yeah, nothing, no. nothing no. from that. Listen to the question. Can you go to Sodom yeah. and Gomorrah? Yes. Well, yes. Yes, yeah. you can. You yeah. can go there. Can you can can you grow anything there? No. No. <laughs> no, the, the the land is dead. Uh and, and, and yes. a bigger and an even bigger question is when you go to when you go visit Sodom and Gomorrah today. Will you see fire and brimstone raining down from the sky? Absolutely not. And he told us the verse. So he's not still judging Sodom and Gomorrah. The judgment itself is not eternal and forever and ongoing. He's not punishing the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is not on fire today. The results, the results of what he did over 3,000 years ago now, that judgment continues the results that's what it's dealing with it's dealing with the results the results are forever the results are eternal that's and what he's it's, talking about and, it, and it's a it's a perfect analogy because the result of the second death is eternal no resurrection no yeah, possibility no resurrection, to life no coming back no uh you know no no other chances after this uh you're brought you're brought back for judgment you're judged you're you're, destro you're destroyed, and, right. that, and that is it. That is and it. First, for, and First Corinthians 15, 26, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, it's in the top ten, says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. God is going to even destroy death. So that concept will be a foreign concept to us in the future. There will be no death. The grave, that death and the grave, hell is a grave shield, 
was cast into the lake of fire and destroyed. So death will not always exist anymore. The day is coming in the future when nobody will die and not, there's no more death. Death is done away with. Death is called, by the way, in the Bible, we, we look at five different deaths here, but there's a name for death. Death is called the enemy. The last enemy that's going to be destroyed is death itself. And praise God for that. And if you Amen. stop and think for a second, we want to be careful as we're handling these verses because uh, most the most people present this, and even right division, people who handle right division, we're so thankful for so many people out there now handling the Bible with right division, so many pastors. This is still a big issue that most of them get wrong. We want to support right division, of course. We want to be very kind and professional as we're handling these, these topics. But that's a, that's a big deal, and it's important that we get that right because it actually affects the gospel. If you teach that people are still alive when they're actually dead, and a lot of them teach that when Jesus, Jesus died, he was still alive and they put him in hell and all these other ridiculous explanations, you're actually denying the fact of what the scripture teaches, that he was dead for three days. Jesus said, I was dead. Uh, it's Revelation chapter 1, I believe, verses 7 and 8. He said, I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Oh, I love that word. He's saying, I'll never be dead again. And if he's not dead when he says he's dead, then words don't mean what they say and don't say what they mean. And we can't use language for communication. <coughs> God said, you'll surely die. That's what he said. That's what he meant. Then he defined the terms by saying, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. That's the title of my next book, by the way. For dust thou art. <laughs> For dust thou art. That's exactly what it means. Death means you don't live anymore. You're not alive anymore. Adam went right back to the dust. Not part of him, all of him. The breath of life goes back to God, but that's not you. That's an animation. That's what turns that dust into a living being, a living soul. Mm -hmm. Very important that we grasp that moving forward. Okay. Number six, we, uh, we, we talked about this, uh, you know, in our conversation. We explained spiritual death. We explained Christ's spiritual death on, on the cross. Uh, verse eight, uh, question eight. Why was it necessary for Christ to die spiritually before his physical death? Yeah, yep, eight, eight's where we left off. So why, so why was it necessary for Christ to die spiritually before his physical death? So that he could take on our sin. From God the Father. Exactly. So, yeah. so that he could pay for sin. Yeah. He, he had to be physically alive to pay for sins. Spir uh, the physical, the separation from God was not part of the physical death. It was the spiritual death. But mm -hmm. it is what, that had to happen before those sins could be imputed to him. Because God Junie, the Father and God the Holy Spirit must remain holy. Junie, one, one yep. other point we want to look at is he uses that Greek expression, telestai, it is finished. Yes, yep. If you're physically dead, you cannot say it is finished. <laughs> if you, you keep, dead, men don't, dead men don't speak. Dead men don't speak. And he said, Ted Lestai, it is finished. Is it, is that, does everybody, uh, is, any, is, is everyone familiar <coughs> with the term Ted Lestai? Yes. Yes. It is finished, but it... it Importantly, it was used by uh, <clears throat> uh, Greek uh, it was by yeah. painters when they when they would complete a painting, and that painting was complete, and nothing could be added to it or taken away from it. And that that's important to understand. So when Jesus Christ was saying that, he was saying that the job the job of salvation is complete. No one can add anything to it, and no one can take anything away from it. Um, so we can't add works to the plan of salvation. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so, so that is why it's important that we understand grace and we understand 
the uh, the parameters of grace. Uh, the also, also, Junior, we want to add to the fact that when Adam sinned against God and God said, "In the day that you 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 know take from the eat of the fruit, you're going to surely die." He used that word, "surely." You will surely die. So Adam and Eve died that same day instantly, spiritually. First now, the, the Greek. Was, the Greek term that he used uh, for that was the actual translation was "dying, thy shalt surely die." Right, dying, 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 you will die. First, they died spiritually. Then, nine hundred and thirty years later, Adam died physically. So this is important. So spiritual death came first, and there's a Hebrew word "muth," M-U-T-H, that's used in the Old Testament with regard to Christ. And it talks about the death plural of Christ. One of the rare places in Scripture where he mentions him his death plural. Now the Bible says he died once unto sin, but that death, that one death, encompassed spiritual death first. Adam died spiritually first, then physically. Jesus Christ is the last Adam. The last Adam died spiritually first, and or excuse me, yes, yeah, spiritually first, and then physically. Spiritual death came first, and then physical death followed. You don't die physically without dying spiritually first, because the wages of sin is death. Yes. The wages of sin is death. The payment for sin, we talked about that word wages, I think, last week. The wages are the payment for sin is death. So when Christ came in contact with our sins for the six hours he's on the cross, the last three hours he cries out, uh, Eli, Eli, Laba Saba. I can't say the word. Say Eli, Eli, Laba Saba. in me. Uh, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He's saying that not one time, but many times, over and over again. And he's coming in contact with our sins for three hours. Think about that. So here he is coming in contact with all the sins of the world, from the first sin Adam committed to the last sin committed at the end of the age the end of the end of the world, and he had you personally in mind. That's an astonishing thing to consider, that he had us personally in mind, and he was able to get all that in, and that's quite a bit to get in, in three hours, the last three hours, when darkness covers the earth, and God the Father and the Holy Spirit are separated from the humanity of Christ. Not the deity, but the humanity of Christ. Amazing. Oh, and then we, number nine, Junie, we just mentioned, the, I thought we covered that, we didn't. The word wages is op opsania. Yep, opsania. That word opsania deals with the word wages, or the payment. And if you, did your reading, yeah, if you did your reading for chapter six, uh, the, the chapter mentions briefly, it does a little paragraph on this word opsania, and the, the soldiers, the Greek, the uh, Roman soldiers were paid fruit and vegetables and so forth. That was their payment for their service. <clears throat> but every once in a while, the ruler, <clears throat> if there was some great battle or some reason he wanted to show gratitude to his troops, he would actually pay them cash. And uh, they were always thrilled to get cash and not just for their rations, uh, food. So they want more than just food. It's nice if you have cash because then you can buy things. You're not bartering with or bar you know, using uh, food as if it were money. It's nice if you've got coins, you got cash. They always wanted that. So this word, apsami, is used in that regard, wages, your wages. And the wages or the payment, the Bible says, for sin is death. That's, that's the result. That's the payment. If you keep sinning, you keep practicing sin, the end result is death. And death is passed upon all men. So every single person who's come into the world experiences death. Elijah died. A lot of people say he, he went to heaven. He didn't. He went into the heavens plural, which was a mountain range. They went looking for him up in the mountains, because that's where they assumed he had landed. Um, we Some people make an issue out of Enoch, 
And so Enoch was taken to heaven. He was translated. He was translated. God picked him up from point A, moved him to point B, so that he wouldn't be killed or murdered by the wicked people of his day. When we get to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews 11 tells you that all these heroes, including Enoch, including Elijah, that they all tasted death. They all died. And they didn't collect their reward from God yet. That'll happen when the kingdom is set up, of course. That's a future event. But death has passed on to all men. Uh, Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 13, I believe it is, he says, no man hath ascended up into the heavens. And I think it's chapter 2, maybe verse 26 of, six of Acts. I have to look at that verse to make sure the reference. Uh, there's a verse that says, David... Now, this is after the crucifixion, after Christ rose from the dead, after he has ascended back up into the heavens. The, the Bible Peter preaching says, David has not ascended into the heavens. His sepulcher is right here with us. You can go visit his grave. Okay. He has not ascended into the heavens. He says no one has ascended into the heavens. So there's not one single person except for the Lord Jesus Christ himself that has descended from heaven and ascended up into the heavens. And when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there's a long dissertation on resurrection. And uh, if you stop and think about it for a sense, it makes perfect sense. Jesus said, flesh and blood cannot enter into heaven. Think about it. You can't even pass through the second heaven, which is outer space. You can't even go into outer space without special gear. So just because you die doesn't mean you're still alive. You're not. And you certainly couldn't pass up into the heavens through the uh, outer atmosphere and outer space and get all the way up to heaven. And also, the Bible says this corruption must put on incorruption. You don't put on incorruption just because you're dead. You don't put on incorruption until the resurrection and you get your new body. That's when you take off mortality and you put on immortality. That's an event. And we do that collectively. We're going to all do that together at the same time. How Amen. wonderful. Amen. All right. Amen. Got, um, what, question 10, what literary device does Paul use throughout the chapter, especially in the opening line, and then again in verse 15? A rhetorical question. A rhetorical question, right? I think we did do this last week. Uh, I think we did cover this. No, no, no. We, I remember. We, we read through the questions uh, as, you know, okay. when before, the, we, before we did the reading, but we'd only got through question eight in answering them. Okay. So, see, uh, so what, what was our definition of a, of a rhetorical question? You already know the answer, but you asked the question anyways. Yeah. The answer is obvious. It's obvious. So when Paul said, shall we continue in sin? He says, God forbid. So what's the, what's the obvious answer? Shall we continue in sin? The obvious answer is no. God forbid. No way should we continue sinning now that we are dead to sin and our sins have been paid for. Shall we continue sinning so that God's grace can abound for us? Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Do we continue in sin so that grace can continue to much more abound? God forbid. No, we don't think that way. We don't teach that. So the obvious break, answer is no. So break that down and give me a circumstance that you've been through where that would apply. Mm. A rhetorical question you're saying, Joe? No, no. Give give me a circumstance where you're talking about where Paul's saying, uh, "Should we continue in sin? God forbid." Where would that, where would that verse uh, be able? Where would you be able to use it? What situations have you been in before to where uh, you're having a conversation with somebody and they make a certain statement and you could yeah. you could answer with that with that verse? Where where could you utilize that verse? Well, when they say, for example... Uh, Michael, I wasn't um, asking for you oh, to answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, guys. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't preface it with Michael. Don't Michael and Osiris don't answer. <laughs> but think. Think about it. What What kind of beliefs do people have? Some. Uh, think. Think of some Christians, or or we would call enemies of the cross, and certain statements that they say. Uh, how could we use that verse to um, to guide them in the correct correct direction? Well, maybe the idea that you can sin because God already paid for all of them. Yeah, yeah, you know, you, exactly. Don't don't, don't don't some people sit there and say, "Well, I guess I have a license to sin then," right? Because Christ yeah. has paid for all my sins, so I'm free to go out and tie one on because He's already paid for right. all my sins. No, right. uh, no, God is not mocked. He's not mocked, and there and there are natural consequences to sin. If the Amen. if the law if the law says don't run red lights or don't speed, and you tie one on speeding all the time or running red lights, you're going to crash sooner or later. Somebody's going to crash into you. That's the natural consequence of your sin. Yes. If you right. if you uh, commit adultery, there's natural consequences of that sin. Getting caught, right. uh, you know, having a child out of wedlock, venereal disease. Amen. Okay, there's Amen. there's natural consequences. There's natural things that sin brings on, and that's what God means. He's not mocked. If you're if you're going to live a sinful life, and especially as a Christian, because then you then you have natural natural things that are brought on by your sin, but then you have a loving Father who's going to uh, punish you and and. Uh, instruct you, and he, his instruction doesn't always come easy. Yeah, well, maybe it might you know, hit you with that feather the first time trying to wake you up. Well, you know what happens? He says, um, We have the example with Paul. There was a man who was committing adultery, fornication with his mother in law. With his mother in law. And he says, I turned him over to Satan, which he could do as an apostle. We don't have the authority to do that. We don't have the authority to turn people over, right? But Paul said, I turned him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his soul may be saved in the end. Wow. That was that that was Paul's apostolic authority. So we don't have that today. We don't have apostles today. So don't worry, I'm not I'm not gonna get upset with you and turn you over anybody listening. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I'm, not, yeah. I, I'm not an apostle, neither is Junior or Osiris. Yeah, but, there, there there wouldn't be any 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 politicians left if we were. <laughs> <laughs> but, but aside from that, the Bible does say God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. Now the, the eternal consequences of your sin are paid for. They'll never be mentioned, they'll never be brought up. They, they're, they're, but if you decide that you're going to live a carnal life, Paul says, Are ye not carnal? Are you, you, you're supposed to be spiritual, but are you not carnal? Are you not living after the flesh? And if you're living a carnal existence, you just don't care about the Lord. You're in a, you just don't care. You're going to just do your thing. You're going to do you and tell other Christians, you do you and I'll do me. <laughs> and, and you doing yourself is doing yourself, and that's the problem. And you will reap what you sow. You can't plant corn and get tomatoes. Right? And he says to continue in sin, if you're going to live that way, the end of that is death. And not only is it the end of that death, but there's going to be loss of reward. Right? If, you, if we, we use the illustration of a pilot or a person who's trying to get their pilot's license, you have to log in so many hours to get your pilot's, to get your pilot's license. Right? So if you're spending your Christian walk in carnality, you're just a living carnal. People are shocked and amazed when they find out you're a safe person. I mean, it's just so shocking that you're actually a believer. Um, there's going to be loss of reward. At the judgment seat of Christ, what you will have produced is not a walk with the Spirit. It's going to be loss of reward. And Paul says, uh, Romans chapter 2, we cover this, verse 16, my gospel we're going to be judged by my gospel. That's going to be the standard, that right division, that, that following Paul as he followed Christ, that walk in the Spirit, by the Spirit, under the, under the control of the Spirit, under the filling of the Spirit. 
that's that's what's gonna that's what's gonna generate reward for us. And there is a difference between your inheritance. Remember, we talked about that Sunday uh, with the message, the sermon, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Well, what's all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? Well, we have a good example of that. All of us are going to get a resurrection body. There's no mention of sin. At the judgment seat of Christ, God isn't going to say to you, well, you know, you committed fornication 10 times, or maybe 10,000 times. I don't know the number. But he's not, he's not interested in shaming you and then throwing your sin at you. That would be the law of double jeopardy. He's already covered that. Christ did pay for that. But, but when we talk about wood, hay, and stubble, and your works, not your sins, but your works being put on the fire, there's going to be a big, big, baggy, baggy, baggy bonfire. That's going to be a sad day for you if, if you're not walking in the Spirit, if you're not controlled by God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, I don't know, since I was offline here struggling to sign on today, but how far did Junie get with the verses? Did we go through the chapter, or are we only looking at the question? No, we read the whole chapter. We read yes, he went, he went through the rest of the verses, yes. Okay, okay, so we're, so we're done with chapter, we're done with chapter six. Uh, we're going to do question, question 12. Yeah, 12. Yeah, question. Oh, sorry. Yep, yeah, uh, number 12, I'm sorry, we missed 12. How is sin pictured by Paul? He created an image, remember? Old man. He called sin an old man, yep, that's one picture. A master or a ruler. Absolutely. He talks about the reign of sin. So sin is pictured as a master. Sin is pictured as a ruler. And he says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin will not have power over you anymore. You know, we, Mike, we, do, we, we, we can only see half your face there. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, that was a good half, Junior. <laughs> we, we, we talk about... Um, Getting victory. How do we live a victorious life as Christians? And why aren't more Christians living a victorious life? You know, we were saved by faith. We started our, our Christian walk by faith. That's how you're saved, by grace, through faith, through simply believing. You heard the gospel. The second you believe what you heard, you were saved. The very second you, you heard the gospel, believe what you heard, you got saved so fast you didn't have time to mess it up. You got saved so really think about it. You got saved so fast, nobody could dunk you in water. A lot of people came afterwards and tried to confuse you, not intentionally, but tried to confuse you, telling you you needed to speak in tongues, you needed to be water baptized, you need to start paying the tithe to the church if you're saved to be they they try to they try to muddy up the waters, but God saved you so fast, even you even you couldn't mess yourself up. You heard the gospel, you believed by faith what you heard, you trusted God, you believed, and you were saved. Now you have to continue walking that exact same way by faith. So God says you're dead to sin. When Satan comes to you and tells you you're not dead to sin, you're very much alive to sin, and you enjoy your sin and all these other lies with some truth mixed in there, do you believe God when he says you're dead to sin? Or do you believe the enemy? We walk by faith means we continue to believe what God says. It's a walk of faith, by faith. And I love what he says. He says in verse 11, likewise, reckon, great word, reckon ye, reckon ye yourselves also uh, to be dead indeed unto sin. So those are our instructions. How do we handle sin? By faith, we, we acknowledge the fact that we're dead to sin. Dead to sin, and now alive unto God. And I like to tell myself, I remind myself, that my sinful nature cannot is no match for God the Holy Spirit. No match. That's no match. You stop and think about that. You know, we used to watch, we still watch uh, boxing. And we would watch Mike Tyson annihilate people back in the 1980s. Oh, my goodness. You, you watched that fight, and you knew 
the guy that was in front of him was like a slab of dead meat. He was going to get cream. He wouldn't, <laughs> he, he wouldn't even last a minute. Michael Spinks and a handful of others. Tyson just plowed right through them. He was a beast. And I stop and I, I consider this contest, if you want to call it that, uh, this war, and, and, the, and your sinful nature and Satan and all the cohorts of hell, none of them can be any kind of a match for omnipotent, almighty, all-powerful God. Mm-hmm. And God lives inside of you. We're sealed with God the Holy Spirit. So there's no, this is no contest. And it's a sad thing to see Christians struggling because they don't know the word and they don't know what the word of God says with regard to your sinful nature and your, and your, your position in Christ. And if we're not aware of the fact that we're dead to sin, that the, the, the victory's already been given, the battle has already been won, you're going to live like a defeated person. Mm-hmm. You're, you're going to be just like that slave a hundred years ago, 150 years ago in the, in the deep South, the emancipation proclamation was signed. It was proclaimed. It was announced. The word got out there. But a lot of people uh, who were slaves were afraid to leave the plantation because it's all they knew. It wasn't like they came from Africa a year ago and, and, and could somehow go back. You know, we're talking hundreds of years later, generations and generations later. So this is all they knew. Where do you go? How do you survive? Where do you stay? You're homeless. How do you how do you hunt and get food and all the rest of it? You're not even you're not even prepared to be free. But God has given us provisions. He hasn't He hasn't set us free. He hasn't emancipated us, set us free so that we can fall flat on our face. Everything you need, you have. And that's why Paul says in Colossians. We are complete in him. You know something interesting, Michael? What, what is something that is not covered in the 613 laws of Moses? The law that of Moses? That you're, that you're dead to sin. Right. It, does, it ne- never mentions yeah, The law never says that. The law, that was and, not, and the law, not the, and the law the can never do the that. The law was to, was, was to let mm-hmm. you know what your shortcomings were of perfect righteousness. It, it never told them they were dead to sin and to reckon themselves dead to sin. That's, and, because that's of, not... and because of the infirmity of the flesh, Uni, the law only increased your sin. It made it worse. It really did. It made it worse. It's holy, just, and good. Nothing wrong with the law. Holy, just, and good. But because of the infirmity of the flesh, it only revealed what a rotten thing I am. Yes. Right? It's a, it's just a mirror. I look into the mirror. I can't take the mirror and wash myself with the mirror. The law is the mirror. The, the law can't clean me. The law is powerless to clean me. All it can do is show me a reflection of my sinful self and reveal to me my condition. It can only condemn me. And, and this, yeah, that's and this a great, is why, great point. This is why uh, right division is important, so that we know that we're following the right instructions. Uh, You have people now who are clinging to the law, clinging to tithing, clinging to repentance, clinging to all these things that were part of the law in order to deliver them righteousness. And the law never, the law could not deliver righteousness. No, never can. Never can. Amen. Amen. Any questions? Do we have any questions? Mm -mm. All right. So, So we got chapter seven for next week. All right. Is uh, seven a long chapter or something we should be able to knock out in one week? Um, Let me see. I think it's short. I think it's a very short chapter. Yeah, we've only got uh, 25 verses. Relatively short. Okay. All right. So... uh, uh, I found it to be quite heavy as far as knowledge and information because I already took a look at it and have read it a few times. It's short, but it it says a whole lot. Packs a powerful punch. Amen. <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 it's, con- it's condensed like Amway uh, Amway uh, di- dish detergent, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It is really it is because I I had to read it over and over and over and over again. 
Okay. Let, let's do something real quick here before we leave. Joe, don't leave yet. If you can hang on for just a minute, and we're glad to have you with us, Joe. Let's read the question for seven because Joe doesn't have the book. Let's just take a two seconds and just read the question for seven. Okay. So cha chapter seven has 12 questions at the end. The first question is what Pauline pattern opens chapter seven? That's the pattern. And then number two, how many Old Testament quotes are in chapter seven? Mm -hmm. Question three, what books from the Old Testament are quoted in chapter seven? So there's a reason why Paul is quoting a lot from the, from the prophets. And we'll talk about that next week. What comparison does Paul, verse uh, number four, question four, what comparison does Paul use to illustrate his argument in this chapter? He gives a nice illustration here, so we're going to talk about the illustration. Number five, does Paul teach that we are the bride of Christ? Does he teach that? Well, we'll answer that next week. Uh, number six, does Paul teach that we are married to Christ? Sounds like the same question, but it's not. Uh, number seven, does Paul teach that the law is bad? Number eight, does Paul say that he once lived without the law? Number nine, did Paul struggle with his old sinful nature? Number 10, did Paul completely stop sinning during his lifetime? That's a big question. Number 11, did Paul address Jews at all? directly in this chapter. And then our last question for next week, why do you think Paul spoke in the first person using the personal pronoun I so much in this chapter? So those are our 12 questions. Let's answer those questions as we read through chapter seven next week and come prepared, ready to discuss it. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay. Um, uh, Je way, uh, Jennifer, uh, uh, Daniels, can I get you to close up, close up for us in prayer? As soon as my, you had another thing to say, Michael. Uh, no, I was just going to say if you're hey, uh, several of you re read chapter seven already. If you have questions, you can contact Junie or I or Osiris during the week. You can text us with the question. We'll do our best to answer your question as you're going through. <laughs> It's and uh, right. Michael, it's, if uh, if if uh, if Joe has an email, if he can send you or send me the email, I can I can scan the uh, the chapter and send it to him. Yes, Joe, can you please send Junie your email? There it is, Junie. He's got uh, he's got his email Gmail account right up the line there, and you can send him the chapter ahead of time so he can read it. You, you said he's got it online, Michael. Uh, he just flashed it online here. The Gmail. Okay. It, it's it, it's in the, the chat the chat window uh, to the uh, you, it, there's a chat button. Oh yeah, you, I see it here. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us, Joe. You're very welcome to to hang out with us anytime. I uh, really appreciate it. I really appreciate your hospitality and having me in this uh, in this study. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Oh, you're Amen. very welcome, brother. God bless you. We're happy to have you. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. I, I'm really. As I told you before, uh, Brother Michael, I mean, I was really excited to find someone else who, 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 who believes in right division and, and condition, conditional immortality. That's, that's a rare find. Uh, I, was, I, I actually reached out to, to the Berean uh, Bible study, and, and I asked him if anybody else uh, believed in conditional immortality, and, and, and the gentleman uh, said he did not, but he thought those were more Acts 28ers. And I was like, no, no, sir. I'm looking for <laughs> mid Acts and people who believe in conditional immortality. And he was, he was nice enough, but I was really, I'm really, I, I'm really thankful to the Lord that, that I stumbled, stumbled upon, upon you on, on Facebook, brother. Well, we've Thank got, we, we've got, uh, Michael's done a couple of sermons on, uh, the, uh, the, the parable about Lazarus. They're really fantastic. And it covers a lot of great verses, uh, and those are right on our our YouTube uh, station. Yes, I've watched them, and I really appreciated them. Amen, amen. amen. God bless. Oh, we're happy to have you, brother. We're happy to have you. Yes, we are. And uh, I think I think you'll find, too, you know, no one group has everything. You're going to be wrong on this issue or that issue. We're all growing, and um, 
we get corrected and we're humble people. We're happy to be corrected. We don't, we, we just want to know what the word says. We love the word. Amen. And what we believe today isn't what we believed 10 years ago or five years ago. We're growing, we're learning. Amen. And, um, you know, if someone shows us where we're wrong, we say, praise God. Thank you for sharing it. And as long as they show it, in, as long as they show it in scripture, <laughs> show it in scripture. yeah, show me, show me if, if we teach something that's incorrect and you, you see that we, we, we ask people, please, you know, don't hold back. We don't feel like, you know, we're, yeah, we're, no, we're, we're right we, 100% of the time and nobody else can be right. No, we absolutely. rejoice. We rejoice in truth. Amen. In Amen. Truth. Yes, Amen. 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 Okay. Amen. Jennifer, can you go ahead and close us up? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together to study your word. And hopefully we are studying your word according to your will, Lord. And thank you for bringing our new member and blessing him with finding us. And we pray for all those that weren't here today, that they're well and healthy. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 All right, everybody. Remember, for is speaking Sunday, everybody. Okay. Right. Okay. Yep. Amen. He, oh, said, yep. he, said he said he's all set for Sunday. Yep, Sunday, okay. twelve thirty. I, I I try to I try to sign on for the room at at twelve o'clock by twelve. So, okay. All right. God bless everybody. God, God bless everybody. See Sunday. Right. Sunday. Amen. Looks like here. you're still you're still recording, June. Yeah, I don't have. I'm trying to find the. There we go. <laughs> Got the button to shut it off.